Welcome to the Creators here at Sum City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by making creators. Art, making what you make. Today on the Creators, Portsmouth, New Hampshire musician Jonathan Blakesley recently released a new album called Ferris Wheelin'. And he shares some of his new songs with us today, recorded with his group, The Band of Thrall. So we invite you to subscribe if you haven't already. Give us that thumbs up, just because, and comment what you find here, what you'd like to find here. And now on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Creators. We are coming to you from some city in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. I'm Tom Jackson. And our guest today, Jonathan Blakesley, uh, is an area musician, and he's got a new album that's going to be coming out uh, in October. Um, so welcome to The Creators, Jonathan. Thanks. Good to be here, Tom. Um, so usually we kind of take a step uh, back into, you know, an, an artist's uh, past. And, you know, as a creator, you're a songwriter uh, and musician. Um, when, when was it that the, the sort of spark, you know, to, uh, uh, to take your life in that direction, to, uh, to get involved in music? When did that first kind of hit, do you remember? Well, uh, music uh, in our lives growing up, you know, for my brother Dan uh, and my, my youngest brother Christopher, um, all of us, we grew up in a super musical household. Our dad... Um, our dad plays uh, piano, and at, one, at different times, you know, he used to play guitar and sing us to sleep, and he'd play trumpet, and we had a drum set in the house, and so, and there was always jazz playing, and Stevie Wonder, and Joni Mitchell, and, and just great stuff. And so we grew up in this, uh, this musical household where basically every day we, we kind of woke up to music and we fell asleep to music, and so it felt like a natural thing. I remember my dad asking me, I'm the oldest uh, but asking me, probably when I was around 10 or 11, just saying, um, do you have any interest in playing um, an instrument? You know, I don't know if you want to take guitar lessons or piano lessons or drum lessons. And uh, I thought about it, and I decided to play guitar. I, it was kind of tough. I was on the fringe of that and drums, you know, because we had the kit. But I got excited about guitar. Um, the funny thing, which I, I sometimes forget, is that I had, when I was 13, so I started taking guitar lessons around the age of 11 uh, over here in Dover, nearby, um, and I got a little bit tired of playing, you know, Oh My Darling Clementine and things of that nature, and so at the age of 13, I started a band with a couple of guys um, I went to school with. Um, one of them was into Aerosmith, one was into ACDC, and I was into the Beatles. So we... We covered all those bands um, with me as guitarist and singer, which is a little challenging. Oh, I'll, I'll say. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, you know, I, I wish I still had a recording of it, but that's when I wrote my first song. I wrote a song called Pinball Heaven, and uh, it was instrumental. I don't remember anything about it whatsoever except that I did it. And my first gig was playing at Berwick Academy Summer Camp, because at that time I was probably, my brothers and I would go to Berwick Academy Summer Camp, and I don't know, somehow I mustered up the courage to ask if I could bring my band to play, and so we probably played for a half an hour, and uh, it was a good time. So, so Pinball Heaven, was, was that uh, inspired at all by uh, Pinball Wizard, by The Who? Uh, you know, it wasn't really... Um, because I don't think I had even listened to The Who at that point. Um, it just happened. I, I liked pinball, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that's about all I remember. <laughs> and the challenges of that, that's quite a, uh, a vocal diversity that you're required to, uh, to try to, you know, pull off. I mean, I don't know if you... Was this the type of cover band where you, you tried to sound like the lead singers, or was that just kind of not really, you know? Well, I mean, at 13, you know, there's only so much you could do. Right. And <laughs> so I just remember I was the only one who was playing guitar and singing, so it fell on me to try to, and, you know, at the time, I wasn't particularly excited about learning Aerosmith or ACDC songs, not that there's anything wrong with them. Right. It just wasn't my, my jam, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
but you know I was elected to play and sing them because I was the singer and guitarist and so and a few years later um, interestingly it's like I you know I started um, I had a band with my brother Dan uh, Dan played drums in this band we were called Darjeeling which the interesting thing is Darjeeling is a T I don't know how I chose that name um, Came back to haunt you. <laughs> yeah, it came back to haunt me. Somehow, like 20 years later, I started a, an organic tea company, which I still yeah. have. Um, and, you know, from, from there, you know, I kind of had a, an on and off again relationship with, with playing music because I really, I don't really have a lot of confidence, you know, musically at a younger age. Um, I would do it anyways, you know, feel the fear and do it anyways, I guess. But, um, you know, so I'd write songs, and but you know, I, I was felt pretty nervous and, and pretty self conscious, and um, and then somewhere in my young twenties, I kind of I got really interested in uh, learning to play upright bass, and then so I more or less dropped um, playing rock music entirely, and I took up the study of upright bass for uh, several years, and then uh, I ended up moving to Portland, Oregon, uh, where I I continued my studies there, um, and I played. Uh, yeah, I played in some jazz uh, combos, um, and then I also hit a wall where, for whatever for whatever reason, I I sort of got tired of playing jazz for a while, and so I went fully back into the rock thing. I had a you know a band called Indigene in Portland, Oregon, and then uh, since I moved back uh, home to the Portsmouth area uh, 13 years ago, I've had uh, you know three four different band projects. So. When you were in Portland with the uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, with the band, what what era was that? Ah, uh, well, I got home. Uh, what is it now? It's 2018. I got basically I got home in 2005. So I was there in Oregon for seven years. So, you know, it really was like late late 90s, early 2000s that I was there. So okay, so uh, post heat miser uh, days. Post right? heat miser. Well, you know, I will say the the time the band that I have I that I had, I remember I saw uh, Wilco's uh, Summer Teeth tour mm -hmm. right then, so that would pinpoint it in time. Okay. In fact, the funny thing about even that is at the time, I did not consider myself to be a Wilco fan. I went to see Mercury Rev, who was the opening band, and you know, I watched Mercury Rev, and I'm like, oh, these guys are cool, and then Wilco came out and blew them away. Mm. I was like, wow. These guys are not what I expected, huh. and uh, so I've been a Wilco fan ever since. Um, so we'll uh, we'll kind of get a little more up to date with the uh, the musical experiences and so on. But uh, would you uh, would you honor us with uh, one of your songs now? Sure. <laughs> somebody somebody out there Somebody's in beautiful downtown excited. Summersworth is getting pissed off. They're right? excited. <laughs> Well, yeah, so I have a, an album coming out in October again. Uh, it's, uh, this is the first one that's ever come out under my own name. Um, and, um, but it's, it, isn't, it started, the idea was that it was going to be a, so, a sort of solo album. Um, but uh, I had a whole bunch of friends play on it. So now it's called Jonathan Blakesley and the Band of Franz. Is the, and, uh, but anyways, this is a tune called uh, Blue Jean. Mr. 
rocking a rope postcard Green chain, you're a pocket full of stars So it's a shorty. Nice. <laughs> I like the ending. I like the whole thing. Well, thanks. So what... Um, we often talk with our guests, uh, creators, um, about uh, uh, their creative process and whether it's that particular song, you know, I don't know if you have a story about the uh, what inspired that, or just in general. Um, are, are you kind of a, you know, a, a more disciplined creator who you sit yourself down sometimes and say, okay, I'm gonna knock out a couple of songs now, or, you know, I mean, there's such a spectrum among creators of different types. Some people are incredibly disciplined. Some people, it, they hear the word discipline and they're just like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's, uh, I figured out something that works for me. Um, and I struggled, as many people do, for a, a while um, with songwriting. Um, yeah, I, I used to be pretty self-critical. Not that, not that I'm not, you know, it's like, you know, it's, uh, but I, I just realized like, uh, don't I think what it is for me when I lived in Seattle years ago prior to Portland, Oregon there was this uh, woman that I met who she wrote a book called Writing on Both Sides of the Brain and there's just something I totally remember from talking to her and from reading her book and she was talking about she had this concept of free write, revise, rewrite and the whole idea in free write is don't self-edit while you're creating get it all out there. Just like, get it all out there, let it, let it settle, then come back, uh, revise and rewrite. And so that process has helped me a lot because I used to, when you're writing a song, it's different for everybody, but um, it sometimes, you know, you've got, like in this case, I've got what I'm playing on guitar uh, and the lyrics, and the vocal melody. So it's very rare for those to all work coming right out the gate. You know, maybe you have a vocal melody and I, I, you know, very often I'll have one, one of those three that's working pretty well. Like a lot of times for some reason, uh, I have a habit that um, it's really helped me a lot. With my phone, I probably have 300 or more little tiny little sound bites of chord changes every single day of my life, basically. Uh, there's even something I came down this morning to kind of, um, kind of run through tunes. And I sat down, a lot of times I'll just listen to the guitar. I'll put my hands down, I'll, I'll listen to the guitar, and, and you know, sometimes I'll, I'll strum out a few chords and, and I just kind of like what's happening. And uh, so I don't always decide to do something. I, I decide I'm going to capture what I like and let it go for now. Mm -hmm. And if I like it enough, I'll give it some sort of little name to remember it by. In this case, uh, this tune, Blue Jean, I think it happened that, you know, I was like, you know. I really like that progression and it kind of started because um, it sounds really the arpeggiated you know the, the arpeggiated picking sounds really great on a 12 string um, which I struggle with because I wanted to bring that too but uh, but you know it's like so I'll find something like that and then my friend Jim Ryu uh, who is a great musician in his own right and he's a drummer uh, that uh, played with me and uh, did some recording on this album uh, he has a jam at his house um, on Sundays and there's just uh, you know sometimes what happens is because when we all show up it's you never know who's gonna show up and there's no plan the only plan is someone starts playing something and everyone reacts and you just have a good time but frequently if there's a little idea I have sometimes I'll just kind of like because um, I have lots of ideas um, I don't want to step on anybody That's not else a bad thing. well I don't want to step on anybody else's ideas so um, but you know sometimes if if nobody's starting anything, sometimes I'll start with some little thing. And, and I do remember there are a couple times at Jim's house, I was playing this melody and um, 
but I noticed, like, I could hear, you know, Jim and, and my other friend, Eric Ott, who was there and playing drums the same day, you know, they're both drumming and they seem to be getting into it and sounded good with the bass. And I'm like, I think there's a tune there. So, you know, I already had the structure and then I just, uh, you know, I started having some of the lyrics come together and then, um, you know, figuring out how I wanted to sing it. And it, it used to be more difficult than it is now. For, for some reason, what I've started doing is, um, you know, the glass is half empty or the glass is half full. I, I'm focusing on the part that's full. Like, I don't want to focus on what, I, what I'm not, you know, because if it was the old me, I could easily feel like, oh, you know, these lyrics are kind of lame uh, or, you know, I don't really like the way I'm singing them. And then the more time I spend focusing on that, next thing you know, I give up on writing a song that could otherwise, you know, turn out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah. So in, in this, in, in some ways, I didn't really think of this at the time, but my friend Eric said, oh, man, sounds like you, you really, you probably listen to Blue, a Big Star. And I was like, you know, I do listen to Big Star. I don't know if it sounds anything like Big Star, but um, anyway, so, so that's where yeah. Eugene came from. Um, so it's interesting that, that you, you use the term, the, the old me. So it sounds as though the, the old me, the old you, uh, was was kind of really self-critical oh yeah a little too definitely. much yeah where do you can you kind of pinpoint you know maybe where you came to that realization and decided you wanted to change your own kind of uh self critique or, or you know how did that come about to you it you know it's for a lot of things in my life i've been very self-critical of um but the uh, the interesting thing is the more ways that I've challenged myself uh, to do things I didn't think I could. Uh, it, it's never comfortable. Like I, you know, I've I remember I did a talk for uh, Creative Mornings uh, earlier this year, and um, one of the slides I used it was from my very first wrestling match. I wrestled the 98 pound weight class for Marshwood High School, and I don't even remember signing up. I have no idea how I joined the wrestling team because I was terrified. I thought I was going to lose every match. But I did join, I worked hard, and somehow I was named MVP in my first match. I was really nervous because we're, you know, we're all queued up in the gym and next to the trophy case. And I look over and I see the name of the guy I'm supposed to wrestle for my first match. And he's, there's a trophy with his name on it. And, you know, and... 16-year-old me is just getting heart palpitations and I'm all nervous and I don't know what happened, but I pinned him in like a minute, you know? Mm. And so, but, it, it, and the only way that, you know, correlates with now is just like, you know, lots of things, you know, starting my own business or, you know, when I went to culinary school, I was, you know, I, I, I don't know why. I just never had a lot of confidence and, but I, I feel like the more times that I've put myself in, in the, the fire, you know, and, and I think with with music, it's been something that um, I just kept doing it enough that, you know, it's like in Portland, Oregon, when I was playing upright bass, uh, this friend, friend Tim DeRoche, uh, this drummer, um, he invited me to play this series of, um, you know, ball jazz ballad gigs on this place, the Sapphire Hotel, which is this cool bar. Um, and I was terrified that he would ask me, but, you know, like, he asked me, and then, you know, uh, I played the show with him and uh, on upright bass, and then I remembered at the end of the night he was like, "Oh, are you having a good time?" And I lied and said yes. And I mean, <laughs> I, I was having a good time playing with him, but I was so nervous the whole time. And afterwards, he's like, "Well, that was fun. You want to do another one?" You know. But it, it's one of these things where it's like I, I think I, you know, it took a lot for myself to accept that. You know, maybe I'm better than I think I am. You know, not that I think I'm amazing, but, you know, at least now I feel like if I enjoy a song, that's, that's fine. I, you know, I'm, I don't need to self critic You know, I, I'm just going to play it, and whatever happens with it happens with it. So. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the whole thing of, like, these big challenges uh, and, and sort of meeting those things, um, you know, I hadn't really thought about it from that angle before, but I wonder, for, for really creative people, you know, when I think about it, uh, for myself and other creators that I know of, it, it seems like that is kind of a common trait, you know. It's not a common trait 
in in just general society or whatever. But it seems as though creatives creators really like to challenge themselves, you know. So you know, for me, uh, rather than just making a documentary about whatever, you know, I decided my first one was going to be about the Iraq sanctions, mm. kind of a big thing to mm. uh, when I think about it, but. Um, Oh, it seems like maybe that is a common trait among uh, among creators. Um, so, uh, could we uh, have another uh, of your songs that you've written? Sure. Uh, whether it's on the forthcoming album or, or one of the older ones? Well, this is another one from... i got a lot of songs now, and a lot of them are fun to play, but I'll play another one from, from this album, which actually the album title is Ferris Wheel, and, uh, which... <coughs> Now that I told you that, I should play that song, but that's not the one I rehearsed, so we're going to do a different one. This one's called Pedestrian Power. So. Walking out on the sand Walking out on the street Over mountains and milestones and I've got some beat feet I've got some beat feet I need some loving Beat feet Bath salts and cucumber slices Beat feet And nothing to prove Beat feet Take a power nap by the pool Walking Wasteland, stepping over clear cut empirical madness. Now for Bambi Thumper and the Seven Dwarfs. Well, the world's getting small and the sun's getting hotter. I got some beat feet. Want some lotion? Beat feet. Oh, peppermint, scrub bacon soda. Beat feet. Nothing to lose. Talk about it. I'll consider it. I have made it this far without a major incident. Knocking on the wood of my guitar. It's coming down to the hour. Lace up my boots and pull my socks on. Awesome pedestrian power. Gonna find another route. My kicks on. I've got to be free. Get the heck out of Dodge to be free. To make like a tree and leave to be free. No quarters for the meter. Be free. There's no time to talk about it. Be free. Get the heck out of Dodge to be free. To make like a tree. That's that. <laughs> nice. Is there a story uh, behind the inspiration for that song? Ah, uh, you know, I. Yes, maybe. Uh, it's kind of like I don't remember how that song started exactly, um, but uh, a few years ago, I went out to Writers in the Round conference uh, on Star Island. Uh, with uh, that year, my friends Guy Capslacho III and Peter Squires and um, you know some other folks that I knew pretty well. And um, but the songwriting facilitator that year was Jocelyn McKenzie, who um, she's great. She's just really she's hilarious. She's this powerhouse, and uh, she's the strict, strict taskmaster. Uh, but she she's um, she's a fantastic musician in her own right. She has. Uh, a number of solo albums now, but she also performed and uh, toured all over the place with as a part of this indie project, uh, the Pearl and the Beard. Um, but there was uh, when we were out there. It's funny. I felt like that nervous teenager again. It was weird, and like you know, I knew people, and I write songs, and you know, it's like year before last. I don't know. I played twenty something gigs, and um, you know. But for some reason, I went out there and, I don't know, I was feeling funky or something, but 
she had this songwriting prompt, which was about writing. You had to write, write a song about a fear, but you didn't fear it anymore. It was something that you loved. And you're like, great, that sounds awesome. You know, and so she's like, if you hate spiders, now you love them. You need to write a song about it. And so at the time, I wrote a song called um, I Love Rejection. And <laughs> the funny thing about it was because of the songwriting prompt and the limited amount of time to produce the song, it wasn't that the song had to be great. You just had to do it. And you had to perform it in front of 20-something people in your group. Yeah. Uh, and so it was kind of nerve-wracking. But everybody really liked the song. They thought it was hilarious. And, and the thing is, I feel like I always used to feel like my songs had to have, I don't know, some deep meaning about, I don't know. And in that case, that, that, that song sort of did, at the, you know, in this sense that, you know, it's like, I don't really love rejection, but, you know, that song I do. <laughs> um, but, I don't know, Pedestrian Power, it's, it's sort of, yeah, I, I think it's this, this feeling about, um, you know, if you're going through hell, keep going. Or just like this whole idea of like, you know, keep on walking, you know, or, you know, mm. a road is made by walking. Um, and that, you know, if, if you let things stop you, um, uh, they stop you. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, going back for a second to the, the notion of, you know, uh, loving rejection and, and writing a song called I, I Love Rejection. Um, I would imagine that if, if any nerves were visible when you were performing that song, it probably just added to the, you know, the humor behind it in a way, because it's kind of like the, those nerves might be saying, you know, please don't reject me. And, and as it turns out, they, they loved it and thought it was a great song. Um, and of course, I mean, don't we all kind of love rejection in a way, folks? <laughs> well, just just know, kidding. Well, it's just, you know, what, what you learn from it. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of what uh, I'm trying to even remember what the lyrics were. But uh, that song came out on, on my last album, which uh, I had a, a band, um, uh, some people that I still play with. Uh, the band was called The Lookbacks. And, uh, and, and anyways, that song went from being like something I didn't plan to write to being, you know, the first song on the record, which is great. So, uh, yeah. Uh, we are talking here with Jonathan Blakesley. Uh, and he's a musician and songwriter, uh, has a, a new album coming out in just a few weeks, uh, and you are watching the creators coming to you from Sun City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. Uh, can we get uh, uh, another song and then uh, maybe talk about, uh, you know, uh, after that where people can find your music and, sure. and so on? Sure, yeah. Uh, let me get that capo type thing. So this song is called Lights Came Down. Um, and it was a song I hadn't written. Now, I, now I'm in a habit of writing songs, pretty much. Like if I go through a couple weeks where I'm not working on a song, I feel, like, I feel a little funny. Um, and so for this album, I had already recorded 10 or 11 songs that were planned to be on there. One day I walked in with uh, my friend Mark at the Electric Cave, and I said, Mark, I got, I got one more song. Uh, you want to play drums on it? Or like, do you want to just, because uh, he's, uh, my friend Jim plays drums uh, on a bunch of tracks there, but what's also fun with Mark sometimes is like, if I have a new song and I'm just tr checking it out, I can say, hey, do you want to just jam on this with me and see what happens? And sometimes he's like, oh, let's just record it. You know, and this is what happened with this tune. So, um, okay. Yes, 
with love Tomorrow lacks an happy So let's talk about uh, where can uh, where can people find your music? Uh, maybe out online. First? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, right now, I have a pre-sale up on uh, Bandcamp uh, dot com. So it's uh, Jonathan Blakesley uh, dot band. I think Jonathan Blakesley dot band dot com. Um, or if you just Google my name, uh, J O N A T H A N B L A K E S L E E, Bandcamp, uh, and uh, I should come up. But uh, right now, the pre-sale's up there for vinyl. I'm having uh, vinyl records pressed at uh, Burlington Record Plant in Vermont, which is, to the best of my knowledge, New England's only uh, record plant. It's been there for a few years, and um, they're doing a fantastic job. So uh, I look forward to driving up there uh, in early to mid-October and uh, picking up a few hundred vinyl records. Cool. Yeah. Nice to see some vinyl coming out again, you know. After all these years, when it, uh, you know, kind of faded out there, CDs came along and sort of pushed them aside. And them and the uh, pork pork cassettes. I mean, what a what a horrible, what a horrible death for the cassette, huh? Well, you, you know, it's funny. It's like <clears throat> I almost forget about the p cassettes, but of course, yeah. I, I played the crap out of them. You know, like <laughs> everybody else. You know, right. I was in high school. That's. I think the first uh, Talking Heads uh, Speaking in Tongues I had on there, and all, all my favorites were yeah. on cassette. Um, and how about touring? Are you planning on touring with uh, once the new album is released? I'm mostly probably, we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll probably mostly play um, regionally, uh, you know, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. 
because uh, I get pretty busy at work <laughs> as we get towards the holidays. But, uh, but you know, otherwise, it's kind of like something I've never really done before. Um, I, I, you know, I guess like a lot of people, you know, putting it out, out an album, you know, I've just always thought, okay, well, it's done. You put it on some CDs, you tell your friends, and you sell a few copies, and and uh, you think about the next thing. But uh, I don't know. This this time around, I'm, uh, you know, my friend Mark had talked to me about, uh, especially in this this the digital age. It's interesting all the all the things, you know, because like um, I mentioned uh, earlier before we started rolling, how it's like. Um, I had an instrumental project for a while called Tiger Belly, and I, it was all um, kind of surf soul jazz related stuff that I, I wrote the music. And um, we ended up with a couple of tunes um, in main office of tourism videos, uh, which is cool. So it's kind of like, you know, I never really thought about stuff like that before, but, you know, I still write lots of instrumental tunes and, and other things. So, but anyways, I'm, I'm just going to um, push this album. Uh, I don't know, I, I guess just try to learn some more about it. There's a guy named Ari Herstand uh, who has a blog called Ari's Take, and he wrote a book uh, about, you know, sort of the new music business from uh, the perspective of a, you know, a working singer-songwriter because a lot of the books out there that have been, you know, I, I have no designs or uh, illusions of selling jillions of copies or things like that, but, but you know, it's, it, you never know who's going to connect with something. And you never know who's going to hear something or, or enjoy it. So I feel like we'll put it out there, see what happens, and just kind of. Um, but anyways, this guy's book is uh, pretty interesting. Um, uh, and he's, and really even looking at my, my younger brother, Dan Blakesley, who, um, you know, he's been playing music uh, for really about the last 25 years. You know, he, he got out of art school, and it was it was funny because, you know, as the family, we went down there to pick Dan up from art school and, and we all thought he was going to run out and get some whatever job. Um, but while he was in art school, he started writing songs and he started playing stuff and, and he, he had his first album that I think was out on cassette. Um, and so the funny thing was, is, you know, Dan comes home from school, we're all thinking, okay, yeah, what kind of job are you going to look for? And he's like, I think I'm going to just try to play some gigs and do some art and you know and somehow even though it seemed like a crazy idea he's he's made it happen you know it worked for like the last 25 years and um but yeah i don't know i i think like lots of things i i feel like it's like planting seeds and you know i think the most important thing about music for me is that i enjoy uh i enjoy writing it you know creating music and i enjoy playing music and um you know and, and hopefully there's some people that connect can connect with what I'm putting out there, but uh, I definitely know that uh, I'm ready to start recording again, even though I just finished <laughs> recording because I have a new, there's even a, you know, a tune I was strumming through this morning. I'm like, I almost forgot about that. I just need to finish the lyrics and I'm on it. And then I had some other thing that came up this morning. I'm like, once I have like two to three solid ideas, I'm like, I'm going to start recording a new album. Yeah. So. Sounds like you're a pretty prolific songwriter. Yeah, I, I write a fair amount of songs. I mean, if I look at, say, like, you know Guy Capislatro the third, probably, yeah. Somebody like Guy, Guy writes a lot of songs. Mm. I don't write nearly as many songs as Guy, but I, I, write, I write a lot compared to probably most people. But, um, but it, you know, in the end, it's all about just kind of, um, you know, it's like this, uh, again, going back to Wilco, there's this, the, this Wilco book that I have, and I remember... Um, I think when I ordered the Wilco book, I just saw the cool pictures and stuff like that. I, I didn't know it actually had some super, you know, life-changing content inside. But um, Jeff Tweedy, uh, the singer from Wilco, he had, he had put some quotes in there because he's really influenced by uh, Henry Miller. He loves the writings of Henry Miller. But yeah. it's also Henry Miller, um, at some point in his life, really got into watercolor painting. And, um, and I just was really moved by what he was writing about it because he was just talking about it's, it's not about you know the pieces that you sell it's not about creating masterpieces it's if if you love to paint it's about painting it's about creating and so um you know that that even helped me feel i don't know just good about writing stuff and not feeling like i had to 
wait to see what the results were of the, you know, what's the Olympic rating for this song? I don't know. You know, it's like, just keep writing songs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you're enjoying what you're doing, that's, you know, that's, that's it. So. Yeah. Well, um, right. I mean, that kind of brings up the whole, there's always been this sort of concept of, of you know, making it. But, I mean, what does that really mean? I think it, it means somewhat different things to different people. And, you know, uh, I think it, uh, you know, for a lot of creators, it, it may or may not mean making a ton of money or, sure. or, you know, having millions and millions of fans. But, you know, for, uh, I think that that point that Henry Miller makes is incredibly important, you know. I mean, you, you, if you're doing it for the love of doing it and, uh, and having that kind of creative impulse, uh, all the time, then uh, that that is incredibly fulfilling in, in a way, you know. I think by itself. Um, so, uh, Jonathan Blakesley, thank you so much for joining us uh, for today, me. and uh, wondering if you might uh, be willing to play us out with uh, one more song. Okay, let me figure out what that would be. <laughs> I didn't really think about that, um, so. Oh, I know. I'll tell you what. I'll play. <laughs> Make sure this thing's still in tune. Uh, well, here's a... Yeah. Anyways, uh, a few years ago, I did an RPM challenge, um, and which is, as you probably know, uh, write and record an album in the month of February, uh, you know, 10 songs or 35 minutes worth of music. And... Uh, I got almost done and I just got stuck and I needed one more song. And my wife was upstairs uh, cooking because uh, she knew I was working, doing all this stuff. And I love yakisoba, uh, style, uh, Japanese style noodles. And so she made yakisoba. So I'm like, all right, I have no time to fuss or think about it. I'm going to just write a song about yakisoba. And so I did. Okay, here we go. That's the short garage rock version <laughs> that I did not rehearse. Nice. Jonathan Blakesley rocking that acoustic uh, Gibson guitar. And uh, thanks again for coming on, the creators. Thanks for having me. Look for Jonathan's uh, music out on his Bandcamp uh, site. And also, uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing him 
live in the area uh, after the uh, the album drops in just a few weeks, uh, sometime in October, from what I understand. Yep, sometime in October, and, and I'll also have the record at uh, White Heron Tea Shop Records at 601 Islington Street in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a new uh, uh, organic tea and vinyl record shop in Portsmouth. Very nice. All right, so we'll... Uh, We'll see you next time uh, on The Creators, uh, and we hope that you will uh, uh, tell people about the show. Um, you know, we bring in area creators to the show and uh, talk with them about what they do and uh, why they do it and that kind of stuff. Uh, give us a thumbs up uh, if you're so inclined and subscribe, and uh, we will see you next time on The Creators. Come